Russians nudity and circumcision. So there we were, Michael and I, riding through California with $7,000 worth of sex doll in the back seat of our Cadillac. We were looking for the answer to a question people have been asking for thousands of years. Something that might just hold the key to long life and great sex. Is it better or not to be circumcised? It seems such a strange thing to do to a baby, to cut off his foreskin a few days after he's born. What's the point? And why do some people do it while others don't? The BBC agreed to let me make a film to find out, so long as it didn't cost too much, or show any erections, and gave me an assistant called Michael Ogden. Hi. He's uncircumcised too. I thought I'd better take Michael for a drink to try to explain how I'd become interested in such a weird subject in the first place. You see, the strange thing is I'd never thought about this until recently, and then right. once I started thinking about it, and you find out a few things, you look at a couple of books, yeah. and you find some things on the web, you find you can't stop thinking about it. And I don't say I'm obsessed with it, and I'm certainly intrigued. If you type circumcision into Google, a whole new world opens up. Is that over a million hits? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. There are even websites devoted to all the movies that have seen circumcision and the foreskin as a rich source of comedy, painfully exploited in There's Something About Mary. Shit! I told Michael that when I was a boy, most of my friends were circumcised. You were a roundhead if you were circumcised and a cavalier if you weren't. I was a cavalier, but no one ever told me why. But it turns out the reason why in America and English-speaking countries why circumcision got introduced in the 19th century was by doctors to prevent kids from masturbating. So are you up for this? I'm up for this. What's yeah. best, cut or uncut? And that's what we've got to find out. We're going to upset some people, though, aren't we? I thought we'd start by going to see the wisest woman I know. Tiger, can I come in? She's 92 years old. So, Tiggy, what can you tell me about the mysteries of circumcision? Fuck all, really, because uh, my husband was not circumcised. But just between you and me, I did go to bed with a man who I realised was had been circumcised. And I did not like it as much as... Perhaps that's natural, as it was in a one-man stand, a one-night stand. But um, I was... I can see it's common sense. You don't have to be told that. It's all that nice skin sort of working backwards and forwards, you know? <laughs> in Latin, circumcision means cutting around. In plain English, it means taking hold of the foreskin with its blood supply, nerve endings, and pain receptors and pleasure receptors, snipping it off and throwing it into the bin. But what's it all about? Well, religion for a start. So we headed for Golders Green, the heart of the Jewish community in London. Why, why are you circumcised? Why am I circumcised? <laughs> because I did it to because me. I'm Jewish. My dad and, did it to me. And uh, I'm proud of it. Everybody says, why do we do this? Why do we do that? And the whole thing is, yeah, it's to be accepted into the Jew Jewish nation. You know? Abraham had a circumcision at the age of 100 or 99 or something like that, so that he could be accepted as God's first Jew into the Jewish nation. So he started that off. To be Jewish, do you have to be circumcised? Yeah. A male, a male at the age of eight days has to be circumcised. Whether it's for religion or not, I think it's very good because if you don't, if you're not circumcised, it's just it's number one, it's healthier, and for Jewish people, it's good. But I think everyone should get circumcised, don't you? Cleaner gets you more girls. Yeah. yeah, a lot of dirt gets trapped in the foreskin. You know, when you have a foreskin, sometimes I hear, I don't know, thank God I've never had to experience it yet, thank you. Um, a lot, there's a furry fungus and grow underneath it, I've heard, but... What is this for? Knob cheese. How do you think this makes us feel? How does what make you feel? You should, you should, you should be ashamed. Put it this way, a lot of people, not just Jews, are circumcised, Muslims are circumcised. The whole of the royal family, every man in the royal family is circumcised. So it's Jews, Muslims, let next less is Christians, they're hanging, come on. <laughs>
next morning, still reeling from the Jews' bad news that we'd be better off cut, we went to see the Times medical correspondent, hoping for reassurance. Most women would infinitely prefer to have sex with a man who's been circumcised. And I can tell you that from my own experience, not only talking to patients, but also we did a, a very small survey where we asked prostitutes who they would rather have sex with, circumcised or uncircumcised. Well over 90% of the prostitutes we questioned preferred it when their man was circumcised. More disturbing news for the uncut. It seemed essential to check the doctor's facts for ourselves. Hello. Hello. I've got a question for you that I hope we can help with. I'm trying to find out whether people have a preference to whether they're circumcised or not. What does that mean? I said, you know, if he, whether he's got a foreskin or not. Yeah, but what fucking hell has that got to do with the price of fish? Love? Fuck off and go and wait for the this time. Do you have a preference to whether a man is circumcised or uncircumcised? Obviously, I mean, in terms of hygiene, of course it does matter. The circumcised one is much better. Do you think you've got a preference, generally? For me, personally, obviously, uh, for hygiene reasons, it would probably be um, circumcised. Really? Yeah. All right, then. All Cheers. Right, bye -bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Dr. Stutford, neither Michael nor I are circumcised. Have we missed out? I, I think your partners may have missed out. And one day you may get BXO or cancer of the penis. You may pick up HIV, I hope unlikely. You may get warts or thrush or herpes rather more readily than you would have done otherwise. And then you would have reckoned you missed out rather badly. This was awful. Dr. Stutterford had made us feel like a couple of sexual lepers. On the other hand, he's a roundhead. Maybe he's hopelessly biased. We needed a second opinion and we needed it fast. So we roared up to Primrose Hill to hear from a couple of young doctors who agreed to talk dirty if we bought them supper. So we want to know from you two, what is the current medical thinking on circumcision, on male circumcision? I would say that the risks involved with not being circumcised, um, namely the increased chance of penile cancer, which is vanishingly rare, we're talking about one in a hundred thousand, mean that circumcision is actually something which medically has very little ground. Obviously if someone has phimosis, paraphimosis or recurrent balanitis, conditions which are indications for circumcision. The primary one is probably phimosis, which is a condition where the, um, where the, the foreskin is too tight, so the foreskin can't be retracted, and so it's medically a good reason to take it off. In paraphimosis you can retract the foreskin, but it gets stuck behind the, the head of the penis, the glands, and then, because it's, the foreskin's tight, blood can get into the head of the penis, but then it can't get back out again. If they don't have any of those, which by and large is the case, circumcision is totally not required and nothing more than a barbaric act, getting rid of something that doesn't need to be got rid of at all. To circumcise a man, does it affect him sexually? It certainly does. Um, lots of women have said that men who have had circumcisions, the, the glands, penis, which in colloquial terms is the head of the penis, that that skin becomes a lot harder because it's not protected by this hood of skin. And this means that this hardened skin is less sensitive and therefore the man takes longer to climax. So Roberta, I, I want to know what's best, circumcised or uncircumcised? Well, unfortunately I don't have experience of both. Having had most of my adult life in England, my only experiences of uncircumcised penises. So I would say that's great, um, but not having experienced circumcised penises, I guess I can't really make an educated uh, comment. So we needed to hear from modern British women who've had experience of both. Where better to look than the Adonis Cabaret? It's a hen party favourite, and apart from us, the only men there would be the strippers.
what's best, cut or uncut? Doesn't matter. No, makes no, no difference. No as far difference as women are concerned, yeah, no, no, it's no difference. No difference. No difference. It makes all. no difference. No. Most men in England aren't circumcised, no. are they? No. So how would you know? How would you be in a position to oh, to have a view on this? The only reason I know anything about it is because my brother had it. <laughs> Why did your mum decide to have your brother done? Um, because the end of his release world off. <laughs> Well, I'm going to just ask you, circumcision, yes. do you know anything about it? I have been with one chap who has been circumcised. Have you tried both? Yep. <laughs> what do you prefer? Not really any different, to be honest. Is it not? No. I don't mind. You don't mind? <laughs> I've been with both. My boyfriend has not got full skin. So I think it's cleaner. Cleanliness is next to godliness. I don't think it's any healthier. He's clean, he baths, he washes his willy. And he's clean. I'm with her, definitely uncircumcised. It's the way to go. It's the way to go. All the skin, all the skin. Let's we go, love girls! It. We love it! We love it! This was more like it. Not all girls want their men cut, and they certainly seemed impressed by Tristan the stripper's tackle. Do you have any idea whether it would make any difference to one's sex life if, if one were? I would think that it would be a negative for the man's sex life because of the lack of sensitivity. And obviously, you know, that's OK when you're 16, 17, 18, but when you're 30, 5, 45, 55, if you're downgrading your sensitivity by 10, 20%, that's a hell of a lot, isn't it? So where were we? Medically and sexually, opinion seems divided. But now there's the possibility that circumcised men just might be missing out. Time to visit Brian Sewell, art critic and foreskin enthusiast. When he wrote an article about the horrors of female circumcision, Sewell was amazed by the avalanche of letters he got from men saying, what about us? And the real argument about circumcision is, for me, why in our enlightened times and we get very upset about the circumcision of women, um, why do we go on circumcising boys? At school, going through the, the, the rigmarole of, of mutual masturbation, um, it always seemed to be so easy, straightforward, simple, immediate, unfussy, untroubled. Just, if you have a foreskin, it's, it's the perfect aid. It does everything that an artificial lubricant does without any of the mess. Brian took us to the British Museum for a short lecture on the aesthetics of the foreskin. There was, of course, no circumcision in ancient Greece or Rome. It would have been regarded as barbaric. It's the kind of thing that you came across in slaves imported from the east or south, from Africa. So it was not a civilized thing to do. What was the civilized thing to do was to pull the foreskin forward, pinch it closed like a rosebud, so that you cannot see the glands. I once heard that Sigmund Freud spent ages trying to find a flaw in Michelangelo's David. Suddenly, he found it. David, king of the Jews, had a foreskin. Michelangelo's David is, of course, uncircumcised. To be circumcised was quite unthinkable in the Renaissance. That was 500 years ago. But now, in the 21st century, genital aesthetics is a whole new, well, ball game. Meet Lindsay Honey, alias Ben Dover, number one in the UK porn movie business. I think girls in the, in the industry tend to prefer guys who are circumcised because when a girl's starting off giving a guy a blowjob and he's got a soft penis, it can't be very nice to have that. I mean, I can imagine if I, you know, not that I've ever done it, but I can imagine if that was in my mouth, it'd be a bit, a bit like a calamares or a, or a rubber band or something. You know what I mean? It would be a bit, a bit sort of chewy on the end, shall we say? <sighs> I mean, I've got a bit of previous when it comes to the whole circumcision thing because I, I was uncircumcised, like most English guys, 
And when I got to the age of 30, I started having serious problems. As your, your, your penis grows, the foreskin fails to, to grow with it. So you end up with a very tight foreskin and a huge cock. In my case, every time I got an erection, the end of my foreskin just literally split and was all cut and, oh, you know, and it heals up again and it splits again. And it was incredibly painful. Um, so I had to have it done for medical reasons um, at the age of 30. And I've never looked back since. It was, it was absolutely a, a revelation when it was done. I had no more pain. I just think it looks nicer. I mean, it just forms a nicer picture, if you like. I was so happy with the result that when my son was born, I, um, the first thing I wanted to do is have him circumcised as early as possible. And I was quite surprised at the opposition that I came up against in the National Health Service when I even mentioned the subject. It was, it was like one of those old, old westerns where someone walks into the saloon and everyone, the piano flat stops and everyone turns to look. Circumcision has always been a favourite with Jewish comedians like Mel Brooks. What, pray tell, sir, is a circumcision? Oh, it's the latest rage. The ladies love it. Oh, I want one. Oh, I'll take two. Yeah. Yeah, put me down too, man. Yeah. I get one. I'm game. How's it done? I take your little thing, see? I put it into this little hole here and nip the tip. Oh. Who's first? Another famous Jewish filmmaker, Alan Yentob, asked Mel Brooks to be godfather to his son, Jacob. Oh, all right. When it came to my son being born, uh, my wife, my partner, Philippa, is not uh, Jewish. She's a Catholic. Uh, I had decided that I did want to have my son circumcised. She wasn't very keen. He, he was born the way he was born, and there was no reason to tamper with that. I felt really that I saw no reason why he shouldn't be circumcised like me. Not really, I have to admit, for health reasons, nor for any of the more traditional ritualistic reasons. It wasn't done in a Jewish ceremony or anything like that. I just sort of felt, well, I am. Why shouldn't he be? I insisted on three things. One is that it should be done in a hospital. Two, that it should be done by the top banana at St Mary's and three, that he himself should be present. I, I took the baby upstairs. He did his little yelp, but nothing much more. And um, who could tell? Since then, I've come to think more carefully and deeply about it. And I have come to consider it as um, an unnecessary mutilation, uh, for which there is absolutely no good medical reason whatsoever. Mutilation is a strong word. That's what it is in my view. So it seems there are drawbacks to circumcision. The medical grounds are shaky, and the religious argument isn't clean-cut either. We decided to seek the expert opinion of Dr. Alan Shamroth, a GP and Jewish circumciser who's removed over a thousand foreskins. Is it essential to be circumcised to be a Jew? No, one's Jewish heritage is through one's, uh, one's mother's religion. And so it doesn't confer status, but clearly what it demonstrates is one's commitment to, to the religion or to the culture or to the faith. So it's a sign of belonging to a club? It's a sign. It's, it's the symbolic gesture that Abraham made when he pledged himself to one God, and it's nothing more than that. The tools really involved are the, uh, that clamp and a, a knife or a pair of scissors? Absolutely. One gently stretches the foreskin, and then you'd place the clamp on, and in fact one tends to place it on at about 45 degrees deliberately to leave the chap with a little bit more skin on the underside, so that in years to come when he has an erection, he doesn't pull his testicles up. And that very narrow slit you can see um, allows you just to pull the foreskin through it. It won't allow the glands to come through, because the last thing you want to do is take off too much or too little. And one makes the incision, um, remove the foreskin, and gently um, close the wound. Why can't it be left to the child to decide when he's old enough? Well, that's a good point, and many people ask it. The truth is, when, it's, when the circumcision is done at this age, it really is as simple as the procedure I outlined. At eight days? It, it's at eight days. Really, we're talking about a procedure that takes a couple of minutes to perform, and the healing is profoundly quickly. It's it, really, within five days, you couldn't tell that he'd been circumcised. If you do it when the child is an adult, and the age of consent is 16, even if you were to lower that, we're talking a major operation here. We're talking a general anaesthetic, we're talking significant surgery with high risks of infection and bleeding. And 
significant discomfort to the, the child, the lad, or, you know, post-operatively. So if you're going to do it, don't wait. Do it sooner than, rather than later. Right. So for Michael and me, what would your advice to us be? Um, I, I, I would have no hesitation in saying don't. I can see no medical reason for you guys to be circumcised unless the issue of conversion was, was, was a real and profound one. If we wanted to become... If you wanted to become Jewish or, for that matter, become Muslims, I guess. Yeah. Don't quite know about the Muslims, though. So, off to the mosque for an Islamic perspective on the foreskin. So, can you tell me why Muslims are circumcised? Okay, as, uh, as you probably are, Islam is a complete way of life. It's like, it's not just rituals in the mosque and that's it, but Islam uh, gives guidance for every aspect of life and circumcision is one of them. Is, is circumcision in the Quran? No, circumcision is not mentioned anywhere in the Quran, but it's mentioned by the Prophet Muhammad. He said basically it's, there are five things part of man's innate nature which, you know, man should do, it's like cutting the nails, you know, cleaning, cutting the, you know, pubic hair, and circumcision is one of those. We have to be clean for prayer, which means there can't be any urine on our body. So, so Muslims actually take extra caution to wash themselves after urinating. So uh, if you have the, going into a bit of detail, if you have the foreskin there, then some urine might get stuck there, and that will cause, you know, maybe irritation, and that will mean that you're impure for prayer. Foreskins are dirty. They wouldn't be there if they were dirty. Why do they cut it off? It lessens a feeling in your knob. No, it doesn't. And how would you know? You haven't used yours yet. Yes, I have. Does circumcision affect your sexual pleasure? I don't think so. Probably you'll uh, enhance. Well, look, what <laughs> yeah. I've read, it should enhance. <laughs> they, they have a yeah, perfectly healthy sexual life. You know, they don't have any sexual problems. In fact, they, they have less problems compared to the ones who are not circumcised. When a Muslim boy is born, mm. is, do you have to do it at a certain time? It's no fixed time, early as possible. Do you mind me asking at what age you were circumcised? I can't really remember, probably the age of 10. Really? Uh, yeah. Same here, actually, obviously. Do you remember it? I do remember it, yeah. yeah. Tell me more about I it. I made a big deal out of it. <laughs> obviously, it, was, it wasn't painful at all. <laughs> obviously, the doctor was there and, you know, painkiller, everything. But I just, I was a bit nervous, so I just made a big deal out of it. You can't have this thing put there. It no belong to you. It's only a little operation. Won't hurt. So that's the religious rationale. Next stop, Notting Hill, to meet a friend of Michael's who probably knows more than anyone about the penis and what you can do with it. I directed a show called Puppet of the Penis, which, which is the art of genital origami. Um, and, you know, one of the guys was circumcised, one was not, I think, in the original company. And you know, we very quickly discovered that there are certain tricks that, that can be performed with a foreskin and there are certain tricks that can be performed without. Hang on a second. I think you're enjoying your wind-up a little bit too much there, buddy. <laughs> you know, it's quite hard to do Kenny from South Park if you haven't got a foreskin. I mean, the Eiffel Tower is possible. There it is, folks, the Tower of Love. But the little baby bird, you know, in which you sort of pull the foreskin open and he sort of tries to swallow the, uh, the fish, I mean, you just can't do that. So, you know, there are restrictions if you want to go into penis puppetry. If you get yourself circumcised, you, you know, you really are limiting your career opportunities. Tim Fountain's latest stage show is all about him having sex with strangers, usually men, and lots of them. I've probably seen in excess of five and a half thousand cocks now, um, you know, which maybe 5% were circumcised. Um, I certainly prefer the uncircumcised cock. Well, there's more mystery to uncut, isn't there? I mean, uh, if somebody's been circumcised, you already know what you're getting, but if they arrive with their hood pulled up, you know, there's a chance that what might be inside might be rather magnificent. I guess what they Tim's enthusiasm well, is shared by at least one girl from Sex and the City. <laughs> 
personally, I love an uncircumcised dick. It's like a Tootsie Pop. Hard on the outside with a delicious surprise inside. I don't like surprises. I like it all out there where I can see it. Shame Sex here. and the City devoted a whole episode to the pros and cons of the foreskin. All I'm saying is uncut men are the best. They try harder. I should know. I've slept with five of them. Out of how many? Infinity. So far, we've discovered that sexually, it's all about individual taste. Medically, there are very few reasons for it, which leaves religion as the main reason for circumcision. In the UK, the circumcision rate has fallen from a high of 50% in the 1940s down to around 3% today. But there's one country in the Western world where between 60 and 80% of the male population is circumcised, and it's not for religious reasons. That country, the United States of America. We follow America in almost every way from junk food to Iraq, so why not circumcision? It's the most advanced nation on Earth, so do the Americans know something we don't? And should we be listening? Time to buy a couple of cheap flights to LA to find out why Americans are so keen to bin the skin. When we got there, there seemed to be some kind of mix-up over our hire car. You did order a small car, didn't you? Yeah. So why have we got a Cadillac? They said that is a small car. We hit Sunset Boulevard to get the lowdown on Californian penile preferences. Hello, I'm from the BBC Hi. in the UK. Can I ask you cool. a question? Yes. We're making a documentary, and you, you may have decided you don't want to see that. It's about circumcision. Cool. <laughs> yes. Circumcision. I, uh, I'm, I'm circumcised. You're circumcised. I wouldn't show you, but I don't want to get arrested. <laughs> I've never seen anything else but, uh, but circumcised. I think most girls probably prefer circumcised guys. Oh, it's cleaner. It's a better look. It's a better look. It's a better look. Yeah. Are you? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> you should be circumcised. Yes, you should. Uh, immediately. I don't think much of that hotel shampoo. We wanted to know how circumcision in America got started in the first place, and we drove south to San Diego to meet a medical historian and author of this book. Pain should not be the first experience of a penis. This is um, Circumcision, a history of the world's most controversial surgery by David L. Golliher. Golliher had uncovered some extraordinary facts about the history of circumcision. The American medical profession discovered circumcision during the 1860s and 1870s as a procedure that uh, was used for all kinds of things, to cure insanity, uh, to prevent boys from masturbating, which was linked to insanity. Um, there were literally dozens of indications for circumcision, and in fact, the medical profession decided that it was such a powerful operation that it should be done a few days after birth because it was like a vaccination that would prevent all manner of illnesses from happening in the future. There's a connection between cornflakes and circumcision, isn't there? Oh, well, Kellogg, the famous homeopathic physician and practitioner, is also the founder of Kellogg cereals, was also a circumcision hawk and believed that circumcision could be used to cure masturbation, which in turn was linked to lots of diseases, particularly mental diseases. Dr. Kellogg and his bizarre medical theories are the subject of an equally bizarre movie directed by Alan Parker. Connubial relations, sir. Your natural urges. Sex. Candidly, Mr. Lightbody, that lump of flesh that dangles between your legs is a dangerous weapon. I warn you, sir, an erection is a flagpole on your grave. There's certainly no evidence that circumcision inhibits masturbation, um, and yet people thought it did and applied it, you know, very um, aggressively, you know, for that reason. Ironic, isn't it, that there's a cock on the front of a packet of Kellogg's cornflakes. This is Kellogg's book, you know, John Harvey Kellogg, the inventor of cornflakes, and this is what it says about how to stop masturbation. A remedy which is almost always successful in small boys is circumcision. The operation should be performed by a surgeon without administering an anaesthetic 
as the brief pain attending the operation will have a salutary effect upon the mind, especially if it be connected with the idea of punishment. It's unbelievable. Circumcision in America was once the preserve of the white middle class. They were the ones who could afford it. But times have changed. What did you make a film about? I'm making a film about whether it's better to be circumcised or uncircumcised. Hey, hey, hey! Huh? Y'all circumcised? Yeah, yeah, we circumcised. Hey, yeah, we circumcised. Oh, you know, we circumcised. We, we all gotta whip it know? right out and do what we do. You, you know, know, we gotta make it do what it do, baby. You know? Man, it's better to be circumcised. Circumcised. Hoes don't like the extra. You don't gotta cut, you probably couldn't afford it. Look, hoes don't like the extra skin on the dick because they don't want to pull it back. That's a real talk. Ladies right. in London, this is us. Hey, <laughs> no. play that game. This man had a lot to tell us too, but unfortunately we'd forgotten to switch on the microphone. The gist was, yes, I've had a lot of lovers, and no, it doesn't make much difference if you're cut or uncut. What really matters is how well endowed you are, and you can see I don't have a problem there. Sex is big business in California, and the LA Weekly is full of employment opportunities. Michael tried to find out if the casting director would hire a couple of uncircumcised Englishmen, but the line was always busy. Meanwhile, I'd discovered something really weird. There's a huge market for sex dolls. The females come in all shapes and sizes. But what about the males? How do they come? couldn't resist checking them out for real. So this is Abyss Creations of San Marcos, California. They make real doll, and uh, we're hoping to meet Charlie, their male doll. Let's go. Hi. Hello. Are you Shelley? I am. I'm Christopher. Hi, Christopher. And this is my sister, Michael. Nice to meet you. Hello, Michael. Michael Guns blazing, eh? Yeah. Watch <laughs> your step, please. It's a, a trippy situation here. Welcome to the doll room. Let's see. Thank you. <laughs> You're so welcome. <laughs> We'd come to meet Charlie, but it seemed rude not to inspect the full range. <sighs> Michael, what are you doing? I'm, I'm touching her breast. This is Smiling Jenny. But as Smiling Jenny, she has no oral capability. She is a fixed position face. Brittany? Now, she most certainly does have oral capability, and the tongue does come out for easy cleaning as well as giving a little more room. Tongue, anyone? So this is Charlie. This is Charlie. What kind of capability does he have? Charlie is actually anatomically correct, and he does have oral and anal capability. <laughs> Of course, you know we're making a film about circumcision. Yes. So where it has to be said, the bit we're interested in is... is um, well displayed. Is yeah, there you go. All of the penises that we make here are circumcised. We can do custom work. That is not an issue. If somebody wanted us to make one that was uncut, uh, we could certainly do that. But the orders that we've had thus far have been for circumcised, so we haven't gone any further with that yet. I'll have a touch. Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah. Um, it's very realistic. Well, I think the BBC have this rule that you can't show a penis above 45 degrees, I think, from the vertical. That's, That's hilarious. So you can imagine you could get to a certain point and right? no further. So, <laughs> That's yeah. funny. Well, I must say, he, um, he feels very real. Yes. Have you ever tried having sex with Charlie? No, honestly, I haven't tried having sex with Charlie. I have, for experiment's sake, tried the part of Charlie, <laughs> if you will. But I've never actually done anything with the doll. So for $7,000, you can have your own bespoke sex doll complete with foreskin. But in America, nobody wants that. They all want him cut. The next day, we hit the streets of San Francisco. Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Dina Dell. Welcome once again to the program. Talking about all the surgery people are going to have on their private parts, their genitals. Friends, this goes way beyond circumcision. We'd come here to meet two eminent doctors at opposite ends of the circumcision spectrum and opposite ends of the Golden Gate Bridge. One is a distinguished pediatrician and outspoken champion of circumcision. 
the other a radio personality who broadcasts across the nation on controversial medical issues and has used his show to air his anti-circumcision views. The movement in birthing today is to make it more gentle, right? We bring a baby into this world, hello, welcome to this world, baby. We're delivering you naturally, we're giving you a very atraumatic birth, and the first thing we're going to do is strap you down on a board against your will without anesthesia and snip off the tip of your penis. Whoa! It's a very, very strange and interesting thing. I have a lot of fathers call me up on the radio and, you know, saying things, I want my boy to be like me. And I offer them up, you know, the retort, well, are you fat, you're bald, you got big ears, what do you look like? I mean, you're going to do plastic surgery if the kid doesn't look like you? And those are the parts of you everybody can see. This is a child's penis. What do you mean look like you? Why do you think it's a good idea for children to be circumcised? Well, there are a lot of health benefits. There are a lot of medical benefits. Starting in infancy, going on into old age, uncircumcised baby boys have about 10 times the risk of uh, getting severe urinary tract infections, local foreskin infections, mechanical problems in retracting the foreskin, cancer of the penis. There's some truth there in that if you remove tissue or you remove an organ, you can't get a disease in it. If we remove breast tissue from newborn girls, if we pulled everybody's teeth, you would not have breast cancer, you would not have tooth decay, a tooth decay as the logic goes. So removing a foreskin, yes, would reduce almost to zero the chances of any foreskin malady. Probably more important is cancer of the cervix in women. Women whose partners are uncircumcised have about twice the risk, two to three times the risk of getting uh, uh, cervical cancer. Well, it turns out we've learned now that uh, cervical cancer is a sexually transmitted diseases and young women in Israel have among the highest rates, you know, in the civilized world. And it really was a matter of chastity that Jewish women were more chaste, had fewer sexual partners and had nothing to do with uh, circumcision. There is actually a social advantage to being circumcised in the United States as distinguished from Europe. Which is what? Well, the advantage is that middle class males are almost all circumcised. So if you're uncircumcised, what they call the locker room syndrome, and if you go to school and all the boys are undressed and so on, if you're uncircumcised, it generally means you're either a foreigner or you're poor. Dr. Schoen is mad about circumcision and was keen to give us signed copies of his new book entitled, well, Circumcision. Thank you very much. So it's all about how you interpret conflicting data and which doctor you choose to believe. While we were in San Francisco, we wanted to know where the gay community stands in the foreskin debate, so Michael headed for Castro Street to find out. Excuse me, guys. I'm making a documentary for the BBC in the UK. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. You sure, you betcha. Hey. It's about circumcision. I want to know what's best. OK. To be circumcised or uncircumcised? Oh, definitely circumcised. Why? The pleasure. <laughs> I have the impression that you get more uh, uh, sensation if you're not circumcised. I'm circumcised, so I guess I have no problem with it. They're both good, <laughs> really. It really depends on how the person uses it. Uncut and cheesy. I like it cheesy because I'm French, you know. Therefore, of course, uncut and cheesy. Yeah, what else? Really? Yeah, really. I'm telling you, you're asking me, I'm telling you. But in America, most men are cut, so what are you going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to look for uncut dicks, of course. I've heard women actually like, uh, they actually like it, right, if they're circumcised. I've well, because yeah, it like adds that. an extra layer of texture there, so. Yeah. But those, those are heterosexual women, of course, which we don't know anything about since we're lesbians. Okay. From an aesthetic standpoint, it just seems to have less to deal with when there's no foreskin. So if you want to you sleep want with to. me, you'd first have to turn into a lesbian and then you'd have to get <laughs> circumcised, so yeah. I like my circumcised penis. So are you proud of it? Of course. Would you like to see? Go on then. I'm being dared to show my penis on the BBC. Are you really serious? It's circumcised. I'm not going to show mine. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Have a good night. You Bye -bye. too. With no definitive answer to our question, we went all the way to Massachusetts to meet the reclusive authors of an in-depth study of the sexual mechanics of the penis. 
The most important thing you need to know about making love that no one could tell you until now by Christian O'Hara with Geoffrey O'Hara. Could it really be that the O'Haras hold the key to the whole foreskin conundrum? We could tell it wasn't going to be straightforward as Geoffrey had gone to a lot of trouble to make visual aids from African artifacts, socks and plastic tubes. Kristen had asked for our questions in advance, in writing, to help her help us make the interview go smoothly. Geoffrey would take a back seat. I thought I'd let Michael handle this one. How can the presence or absence of a foreskin make any difference to the sexual experiences of A, the man, and B, the woman? Okay, let me just get set up for this. Yeah, you want to probably turn this so that they're looking at it this way. Yeah, I'll, I'll come like this, and then you'll have to yeah, come Yeah, that's in. good. No, yeah. that's good. That's if you show them... So, so if you leave the, white, the whiteboards on the table... Right, let me, now, let me think of how... Really shot, so. Yeah, I think that... Uh, you, did you want this one too? So no, not in this no, one. No, no, you have to show and it. No, that's in one. another question, Jeff. So, so the question is, how can the presence or absence of a foreskin make a difference to either partner? There are several differences for both partners. And one of the primary differences is what I call the coronal ridge hook. The head flares out from the shaft and it forms a very definite hook-like feature to the head. Whereas in, for the natural penis, the foreskin will tend to bunch up on the outward stroke and it covers that coronal ridge hook. Now, the coronal ridge hook for the circumcised penis scrapes the walls of the vagina with every outward thrust. And another reason that's very important has to do with the softly, what I call the softly stiff characteristics of the natural penis head versus the abnormally hard circumcised penis head. And we devised this demonstration. What's that loose the bit of skin there, or that extra bit? That's the uh, foot of a sock. Hard. This is what's really important. The head of the penis has a resilience and a give to it. it and it can flex and bend, so that when a man thrusts, it, it will gently caress the vaginal walls. Now, for the circumcised penis, if I pull this back, when the circumcised penis gets erect, there really isn't enough skin to accommodate the erection. And it pulls down even on the head of the penis. And the penis now becomes abnormally hard and compacted. And when this is thrusting the vaginal walls, to an experienced woman who's had the, ex the comparative experience with both types of men, it really feels like an intruder and it feels like a foreign object, whereas the natural penis just feels so sensuous and wonderful. All right, you do now Jeffrey was going to demonstrate the ins and outs of the uncircumcised versus the circumcised penis. Note the Jubilee clip representing the coronal ridge. When the natural penis withdraws on the outward stroke, we can see that the foreskin bunches up. And when it does so, it actually keeps the natural lubrication trapped inside the vagina by blocking the entrance. Now, the situation is entirely different with the circumcised penis. Since there's no foreskin to bunch up, every time the man withdraws his penis, each action that he does this has the potential to just draw the, the, the moisture right out of the vagina. See, there's nothing, there's no blocking action that the foreskin was doing. It just draws it right out of the vagina. Like most American men, Jeffrey was circumcised as a baby. When he began having sex, he realized something was missing. Circumcised sex was always a disappointment. You could go out with the most beautiful woman in the world with the most delicious looking body and, and you say, wow, boy, and you have all these expectations for having super fabulous sex. But then afterwards, you're, after circumcised sex, you're always left with this sense of incompleteness. Even though I had read many guidebooks on how to be an excellent lover, the common complaint was my thrusting. It was the way, it was the actual mechanics of the penis. See, I have the unique ability of having both experienced. I was a circumcised man. But then when I was 42 years old, I underwent a, a uh, surgical restoration of my foreskin. 
Incredible. Encouraged by Kristen, Geoffrey had paid a small fortune to have a new foreskin made out of his scrotum. Very soon after my foreskin was restored, I noticed that it was dramatically different. But even as time goes by more and more, he still are fully impressed. Every time we have intercourse, we're fully impressed of the dramatic difference between circumcised and natural intercourse. With another book for his collection, Michael hit the internet to discover that the O'Haras are not the only advocates of foreskin restoration. Hello, I'm Dr. James Hoy. I'm the inventor of the Tugahoy foreskin restoration system. Hi, I'm Roland Clark, president of American Body Crafters. We're the manufacturers of the PUD Tugger. Hi, I'm Ron Lau, the inventor of the Your Skin Cone and president of TLCTugger.com. The secret is to encourage new skin to grow using a special technique called tugging. And voila, in just 42 months, there you have it, a brand new foreskin. This is how it works. This, the inner shell goes over the head of the penis. The skin is pulled up like this. You just simply place the outer shell over it like this. And then when you pull, it, it automatically grips. And when you apply tension to skin anywhere in the body, then new skin actually grows. The way it's ordinarily done is an elastic strap is attached here and it's run down the leg to a sock. And, and then as you walk, with each step, the, the elastic strap gives a tug. Well, this is my family's kitchen, and it's also the TLC Tugger factory. In fact, I have some products just being finished in the oven now. This is the TLC Tugger piece, and with this, one would place the glands in this concave portion and then roll the shaft skin up onto the body of the Tugger, take the your skin cone, pop it on, and it retains the skin in between the inner and outer piece. When you tug on it with a strap, it's held tight. And that's basically what I look like during the day at my nine to five job. I wear loose pants and no one is the wiser that I'm, I'm tugging on my foreskin. Sex is better. Masturbation is better. Everything about it is better. We have the, the metal piece with the hole through it and we insert the head of the penis into the cup and then you bring what's left of the shaft skin up over the head of the penis. Then you take tape and we go around the skin first and go onto the metal and then you just let it hang. And then when it's hanging, you can add additional weight to it and uh, it's comfortable to wear. As a matter of fact, when you don't have it on, you miss it. Some of our patients wanted something a little more anatomically correct. Tugger GP, Grand Phallus. You can use your imagination with a lot of things when you have a foreskin, when if it's not there, it's not there. Did you get that big one? The 18 ounce one? No, did you? Yeah, it was really heavy. Just imagine hanging that off your todger. He said it was kind of erotic. The circumcision rate varies from state to state, but in parts of middle America, it's so common that to be uncut would be just plain weird. The Cohn brothers played on this when they wrote their script for Fargo. Okay, I want you to tell me what these fellas looked like. Well, the little guy, he was kind of funny looking. In what way? I don't know, just funny looking. Can you be any more specific? He wasn't circumcised. In Fargo, the circumcision rate is around 90%. We ordered a beer and wondered if we dare tell the guys what had brought us here. Are you shitting me? <laughs> I grew up in the hockey locker room. Uh, we had one guy on our team. One guy on one our guy team. One guy out of the whole crew. Yeah. Wasn't done up. The best thing is circumcision. Yeah, you do it. Everybody does it. It's just the way it is, so. I suppose I'll have my kid do the same. I will. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll do the same thing. I don't know why. I don't know if it's right or not, but that's just it seems like that because that's what I've been brought up with. And that's the norm around here, yeah, I guess. I think so. We'd come to Fargo because in 2003, the town was the unlikely setting for the first real attempt to put circumcision on trial. Right, you're gonna At the center of the case was Zenas Bear, 
a human rights lawyer who believes that routine infant circumcision should be outlawed. His clients were Fargo couple Anita and Jim Flatt. They didn't think twice about having their baby boy circumcised. Jim was, and Anita had never known a man who wasn't. But after the operation, they were horrified. I wish we would have known. It was very bloody. You kind of feel helpless. You, you know there's pain there, and my husband was like, it looks like a bloody stump. What's going on? Anita Flatt had signed a hospital consent form, but claimed she was unaware of the details of the procedure until her husband, Jim, did some research on the internet. The biggest shock was when he came home and he said, they strap them down. I never, we never, they strapped them, whole, I mean, they strapped the babies down like spread eagle. If we would have been told what it really was, he wouldn't have had to go through it. The couple decided to sue the doctor and hospital. Zenas Bear took the case on, hoping to expose what he considers a medical scandal. But when he asked to show the jury the circumcision equipment, the judge refused. The first tool that I'd like to show you is what is known as a circumstraint. Four straps, and it immobilizes the baby, not unlike something you would expect to see in some torture chamber. The circumcision clamp was marked as Exhibit 2. So you'd have the foreskin on the top of this plate, then you'd hook up the device and screw it down tightly, crushing the entire vascular system so that there are no bleeders after it is cut off with the scalpel. Being pinched here is the most erogenous tissue of the human body. Unsurprisingly, Zenas Bear lost the case he was up against a medical establishment that circumcises 3,000 babies a day and earns hundreds of millions of dollars a year in the process. What they are doing is trying to hide this procedure once again, not only from the parents who have just celebrated this joyous occasion of having a new baby brought into their lives, but they're trying to hide it from the general public. Make my move. The Bear family is unusual in Fargo. All three sons are uncircumcised. To us, simply, it was the humane thing to do is, is to keep that scalpel away from our boys' private parts. Chuck. What I've heard is the uncircumcised males have a higher level of excitement and perhaps get excited easier and earlier. Now, this has nothing to do with longevity of an erection, but simply the degree of sexual pleasure and excitement is almost, from what I've heard, uh, men consider almost unbearable um, pleasure. Whereas uh, the circumcised men don't seem to get up to that, that height of pleasure. Those of us who have been cut have nothing to compare it to. I can only imagine the pleasure that I am missing as a result of that. I can only imagine that it would be magnified by a multiple fold if I were not cut. If the clitoris that I own did not have its foreskin, I don't think I would enjoy sex nearly as much. I would imagine being a man, I would, if I had a foreskin, I would not want to give it up. I would not want to give it up. We headed back to London, where we needed to make one last call. We wanted to know where the British medical establishment stands on circumcision. Leaving religion aside, how should we understand what's going on in America? I mean, why do they routinely circumcise? Well, the vast majority of baby boys in America. Well, I think, I think for two reasons, quite bluntly. I, I think um, practitioners of circumcision, surgical practitioners uh, in the United States uh, have tended to take a view on the evidence, the so-called evidence, that there is a very good medical reason, a medical benefit to be had uh, in terms of the prevention of infection, the reduction of cancer rates. Um, 
many other observers, myself included, regard that evidence as extremely dubious. Uh, the second, uh, I'm afraid, tends to come from the fact that uh, circumcision in the United States is a, a multi-billion dollar industry, and a multi-billion dollar industry has tend to go on trying to justify uh, the money it's making out of what I think is profoundly unethical practice. Some people would say, look, what's all the fuss about? This is a very trivial procedure if done on a, on a child. It's not a trivial procedure. It is the removal of a part of the penis. It has risks. There, are, there is morbidity and even mortality associated with circumcision. There is the risk of infection. So it isn't risk-free. To undertake surgery that is essentially a, a mutilation in some people's minds, uh, and certainly one that has no medical benefit other than outside religious imperatives and rare medical reasons, uh, is unethical. Back at the BBC, working through everything we'd seen and heard, what had we learned on our journey? Well, we asked about sex. I don't mind. <laughs> Not really any different, to be honest. They're both good, <laughs> really. It really depends on how the person uses it. We spoke to doctors. Circumcision is totally not required and nothing more than a barbaric act. I would have no hesitation in saying don't. And then there's religion. No, circumcision is not mentioned anywhere in the Quran. I just sort of felt, well, I am, why shouldn't he be? I suppose I'll have my kid do the same. So it's all about conformity. Circumcision is a tribal mark, a membership badge, a sign that you belong. Being pinched here is the most erogenous tissue of the human body. Do I think this baby should be circumcised? No, I don't. I think it's wrong. But then I would say that, wouldn't I? I'm uncut. Next tonight here on 3, we meet up with tonight's credit card cavalier, Adele Maguire. She is tonight's Spendaholic next.